Hi, I'm Mike Dilk and you're listening to the Relax Bank UK show. The show that explores all kinds of health topics relevant to you, your family and your friends. Each week I talk to expert guests from a range of backgrounds to inform and entertain you. So please do join the Relax Bank UK family and stay tuned. Hi and thank you for joining me, Mike Dilk, on this week's Relax Bank UK show. Topic is low testosterone levels in men. My guest is Ross Tompkins of Alphagenics, and we talk the symptoms, uh, the tests for low testosterone levels, uh, taking extra testosterone and how you actually do it, and also how the situation can indeed be missed. For instance, it's commonly misdiagnosed as depression. A man presents you know, with low mood, low energy, lost their zest for life, and that will very often result in the GP saying you're depressed, and prescribing them SSRIs or Prozac or fluoxetine or something like that. This is a topic that I haven't really heard much about and it does seem to be a growing issue. So please do stay tuned for a great show. Thank you. So my guest is Ross Tompkins of Alphagenics. And first of all, I asked him if it was his company and uh, if he started it. Exactly. Yeah. So we started Alphagenics two years ago. Uh, Alphagenics is a hormone optimization company. So we're helping men through the andropause. OK. All right. So following on from that, I suppose I've, I've got to ask sort of what, what your background is. You now, are, are you a medical person? Are you a medic or a scientist? What's a, what area do you come from? Yeah. So by background, I'm actually a physiotherapist. So I qualified in the 90s spent you know almost 20 years uh, helping patients with bad backs bad knees bad elbows the the usual sort of thing um but 10 years ago i actually suffered with low testosterone so stumbled into this hormone space by accident when i was feeling absolutely ghastly uh, and didn't know why so yeah from a medical background although i'm not a doctor i can't prescribe we have doctors that do that side of things okay all right so that obviously drove the interest uh, and you said you felt ghastly which i suppose again leads on to what are the symptoms of having low testosterone and it's you you you've lived it so you <laughs> you you know full well but tell us yeah so the, the, the symptoms are are many very much like menopause you know there are probably 50 symptoms that people can manifest with but i'd say the co- the common 10 or so that we get are low mood low energy low libido, erectile problems, brain fog, feelings of sort of anxiety and depression, uh, putting on weight, particularly around our middle, um, struggling to uh, lose that weight, slower recovery after the gym. Maybe it doesn't matter how hard you work, you still can't put any muscle on um, and, and brain fog. So these are the main ones. A man doesn't have to have all of them. They may present with just three or four um they may have every single one and actually it's easier to ask them what they don't have when you when you sort of give them the list or the standard questionnaire which is called the aging male uh the ams or the adam questionnaire which are standardized questionnaires used all over the world and they sort of say well i've got all of them you know it, right. it, as i said before it's easier to say what i don't have so but so the they con- are the sort of things you might associate with a, an el- a, you know an elderly man or just you know someone who actually is quite old yeah, un- unfortunately, that is what happens a lot. So men go to the doctors and the doctor says, you're just getting old, get on with it. Um, that happens, unfortunately, all too often. And the reason for that is, well, if we flip it around a second, if a woman went to the GP and presented with all of those symptoms, the doctor would say, I don't even need to do a blood test. You're menopausal. Here, have HRT and would prescribe treatment. If a man goes with those same symptoms, the doctor says, you're just getting old, get on with it. Um, it's the great big you know, discrepancy between, between the genders there and, and a health inequality, which we see all the time. I think the reason for that is how it presents. Now, in a, in a lady's body, the hormone changes are quite abrupt. So usually within weeks, months, um, things change. Sleep is, is, you know, one of the things that often is affected. Mood becomes far more erratic. Uh, body weight changes, all of these things, but it's quite rapid. So that onset leads to an easier diagnosis. In a man, we lose one to two percent of our testosterone production per year 
from the age of 30. So it's such a slow decline that men slowly just acclimatize and get used to it and think it's normal. So because it's not so obvious, it's usually and sadly missed. Okay. All right. Are, are any of the things or any of the other symptoms, are they kind of uh, anything more than quality of life affecting? Are there any of them dangerous? Can any of these things kind of kill you? Um, so, so none of them will, will kill you directly, um, but what, you know, many of them can lead on to other things. So, for instance, it's commonly misdiagnosed as depression. A man presents, you know, with low mood, low energy, lost their zest for life. And that will very often result in the GP saying you're depressed and prescribing them SSRIs or Prozac or fluoxetine or something like that. Um, now, that, of course, doesn't fix the problem. It's like just sticking a Band-Aid on it and it's sticking a Band-Aid on the wrong part of the body. It's not even a, a depression right. anyway. Um, that then usually leads to further mental health problems. And of course, that can result in suicide. And actually, there are three moments during a man's life where we are more susceptible to taking our own lives. And all of them are associated with hormonal changes. So the first one is during adolescence when we have that boom in testosterone. Um, and unfortunately, we do find younger adolescents there taking their life midlife so sort of 40 ish when our testosterone is usually going through the the decline and symptoms can occur again we see this spike and then in our early to mid 60s uh, when that testosterone production takes an even further re uh, reduction again we see this spike and i think that is because it's sadly misdiagnosed as as low mood and depression okay right so potentially this is pretty serious or it can be quite serious this isn't kind of a minor inconvenience or annoyance it, it actually can be pretty serious a hundred percent i mean I, one of our patients at the moment um he reached out about a year ago after he read one of my posts and listed the symptoms he'd actually he confided in me just recently uh even though we've, we've known each other for a long time he said you don't realize how timely your post was he said i'd actually driven to my old house where I moved, because brain fog was that bad, he said I'd, I'd moved two years before. But I actually drove to my own old house and it affected me so much, I went to the doctors and thought I had dementia. I thought this was it. And he said, the doctor said, no, you're just depressed. He said, I actually considered taking my own life. And I was, I was making that decision when I saw your post. And I thought, hang on, these symptoms could be something else. And indeed it was, a year later, He's a completely different person in a great um, all round health. And, you know, that, that now he, he can look back on and, and talk about it openly. So it yeah. it truly is, you know, transformational when someone who rightly requires treatment gets it. Sure. OK. Um, is there a link with diabetes? Because I'm sure I've heard somewhere. <laughs> I'm not sure I can really remember where that. Uh, there's potentially a link with, with diabetes and low testosterone, whether it's causative or it, or it just happens at the same time. Yeah, so actually a study came out just very recently and, and proved, which anecdotally we've known for a long time, which is uh, testosterone replacement therapy, or rather optimal levels of testosterone, um, reverses type 2 diabetes and then stops you from getting it. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's an incredibly powerful medication from that regard. Okay. Um, presumably you have to do other if you've got type 2 diabetes it's not just just testosterone is going to help there's uh, other things you have to do as well like well, testo testosterone when someone has type 2 diabetes when, you know, when their lifestyle is has led them down that path you know they're not exercising they're not eating very well they're not sleeping very well they're putting on weight um often it's very, very difficult to make positive lifestyle changes because you feel awful. Um, TRT completely changes that. So when you optimize someone's hormones, it's like giving them a brand new starter motor in the body. All of a sudden, energy goes up, motivation goes up, you start making better lifestyle choices. So it becomes this positive spiral where all of a sudden you feel better, so you start going to the gym or start exercising in some way, maybe walking the dog. Because you're exercising more, you see some reduction in your um, weight. 
because your weight goes down, your energy goes up, you start making better dietary decisions. And it's this lovely positive spiral. Um, but often, although we all know we should do it, it's next to impossible without that kickstart. And that's what TRT often does. Sure. Okay, all right. So if you are uh, suffering from these symptoms or you know someone who's suffering these symptoms, what's next? Presumably, you've got to find out for sure uh, whether you're suffering from low testosterone. There must be a test of some kind. Uh, what is it? How do you do it? Yeah, so it's a, it's a blood test. Um, so if someone is just generally curious, I would say, um, then go for a finger prick test. You know, they're cheap. Uh, e easy to get hold of you do it in the comfort of your own home it'll test you for your total testosterone that's flowing around within the blood and that'll tell you where you are on the continuum and the nhs says that uh, somewhere between approximately 8 and 31 nanomoles is considered to be normal normal is an odd word to use and that range is quite large as i'm sure you can appreciate it doesn't it doesn't take into consideration if you're 18 88 overweight super fit ill it's just a big range uh that is not an optimal range optimal is the upper quartile so it's that top end where men feel youthful vibrant energetic we're making quick cognitive decisions uh, our libido is working we're keeping off belly fat we're building lean muscle so we want to be in that upper quartile that's that's optimal so okay. it's just general curiosity finger prick test is a great way to start so is if that a test you can buy from the chemist is that an easy, can't easy buy, to do it yourself can't buy it from the chemist but you can buy it from various providers online including ourselves but there are a number of providers out there blood blood testing companies uh they're, they're usually around about 30 pounds um you do the test in the comfort of your own home uh, there is a bit of a knack to it you know you've got to make sure that your blood is pumping so jog around the room windmill your arms around your head run your fingers under the warm tap because uh, a lot of people say oh, i couldn't get any blood out and it's typically because they've just woken up they're cold haven't been moving and the blood wasn't circulating properly and then it can just be a waste of time and money so make sure you're warmed up before you do that test but right. if you are if you are if you have all the symptoms and you're seriously considering whether trt might be an option for you um, it's usually worth going for a more detailed blood test where they actually a nurse will take the blood out of your arm and test you for at least you know 40 different biomarkers it's a bit like an aging male's mot uh, it's far more detailed far more accurate uh, and from there you know we could make a diagnosis and potentially prescribe oh because i was going to ask you about the accuracy the accuracy of a, a finger prick test um that you can sort of buy online uh, my first thought is really hmm, okay are they yeah it's it's a little bit like you know comparing a chemistry set children's chemistry set at home you know you bought from you bought off amazon to a laboratory test it's not quite the same thing however what i would say and you're also you're testing interstitial fluid rather than venous blood so you're going to have a difference there if you're testing one marker fingerprint tests are pretty good if you're trying to test multiple markers a finger prick test really does start to lose its uh, lose its efficiency lose its effectiveness um but for one thing for general curiosity you know if you don't want to spend a load of money then actually that's a really great place to start okay and if you want to get a, a blood test where a nurse actually takes blood out your arm and that gets tested in a lab um yeah. how how do you go about doing that um, so again, you know, there are a, a number of providers out there that can do that. Um, at, you know, you go online, find the provider that you want to work with, whether it's Alphagenics or whether it's at any, any of a handful of other ones, uh, get in touch with them and, and ask them to book an appointment. Um, some will some will ask you to go to a clinic somewhere. Others will send a nurse to your house, as we do. Um, it depends on the company you choose. Right. And do you comment on the 40 other markers? Because I have to say, in, in some instances, I do find, you know, if there are 40 markers, 40 things you're looking at, they're going to be different for everyone. They're going to depend on what you had for breakfast, all kinds of things. This sounds like a recipe for potentially really scaring people when it's somewhat unnecessary. 
Uh, it's actually completely necessary. So it's the other way around. You're actually no doctor in no credible doctor in the world would prescribe TRT based on one marker alone because you don't know the overall health of the patient. So you need to know what they're generally like. You know, is their liver working properly, their kidney working properly? Do they have any inflammation anywhere? But also, we you know, we're checking their thyroid, their vitamin B, their, their iron levels, because those things can present in a very similar way. Low mood, low energy, lethargy, brain fog. So we need to ensure that the whole body is working well and it is only a TRT, a, a testosterone deficiency. OK, I guess. So you guys I, I will, will only suggest people take testosterone uh, as a replacement if they've had a, a, a blood test looking at lots of different markers. Correct. Yeah. OK. All right. I get it. Um, all right. Let's move. So that there's a, there's a whole <laughs> testing way of testing, which uh, you kind of if you're worried about this stuff, it is sensible uh, to in, engage with uh, one way or another. Um, can you do that via your GP? Um, so, yes and no. Um, <laughs> the, the lion's share of men who go to the doctors and ask for a testosterone test will be told to go away, un unfortunately. Um, we see that every single day. Uh, it right. was my own experience as well. And then the thing that you have to be mindful of is remember the NHS are looking for normal levels. So if a man goes to the to the doctors and they have a level of 8.1, the GP says, congratulations, Mike, you're normal. Go away. If at 7.9, they might say, oh, yeah, it's a little bit low. Um, but let's test you again in another month or so or try and tweak your diet a little bit. Um, worse still, sometimes they may be prescribed treatment. We see this often again on the NHS. But as soon as the level goes up to nine, they say, well done, Mike, you're normal. Yeah. Um, and either they keep them at nine uh, or worse still, they sometimes say, I'm going to take you off your treatment. And then it just goes, goes back down again because yeah. exogenous synthetic testosterone has a half-life. It stays active in the body for a certain period of time. And as soon as it's not working on you anymore, you just go back down. So, you know, unfortunately, yes, you can get tests, although they are difficult to do. Usually when you can get a test on the NHS, they're not acted upon. And if they are acted upon, they don't take you to an optimal level, just a normal level. Um, and this isn't a criticism, by the way, of, of the NHS. They are lit, they are dealing with the knowledge that they have. Um, and unfortunately, you know, GPs are general practitioners. They know a little bit about a lot. That's a great skill to have. I'm not putting that down. But they're not experts in andrology, study of men's health. They're not experts in endocrinology, the study of hormones, and they're certainly not an expert of both of those things. Yeah. OK. All right. Let's move on away from the testing. Uh, I, I was looking at, at some of the information you sent uh, through and I, uh, I, I kind of stumbled across one word which scared the hell out of me. Hypogonadism. I read that and I thought, goodness me, I don't want that. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but I don't want it. Tell, what, what is it? It's basically just a fancy word for low testosterone. Right. I thought that was probably the case. <laughs> yeah. 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 Same as hypothyroidism is an underactive thyroid gland. Hypogonadism is an underactive gonadal system or underactive testosterone, uh, okay. low testosterone. Right. So how, how many of us men, how many of us men actually have this? Does anyone know? Yeah, yeah we do, actually. So um, most recent research that's just come out. Um, from a urolo urological society in the US, say 20% of men aged between 15 and 39 have low testosterone. And over 40% of over 40-year-olds have low testosterone. So this is incredibly prevalent. We also know that testosterone has halved in the last 50 years. So our grandparents had double the testosterone we did um it's it's a scary time to be alive so that that, that last statistic that the fact it's sort of going down for all of us um why well, in some ways that's terrifying so what well, i mean what's causing that is it is it a developing world problem a first world problem or is it just in the uk what, what's going on oh, it's ubiquitous it's it, it's everywhere um and it's a it's a complex it's a complex area. There isn't one reason. 
it's probably a perfect storm, if you like. So if you go back 100 years or even 50 years, you know, men in general generally had more active roles. They were they were more sort of labor intensive, whereas we now sit on our backsides a lot more. And um, testosterone is produced when we exercise and in particular when we exercise to fatigue. So when you're tired, you have this boost in testosterone. Men generally don't push themselves very hard anymore. We're just sitting around on the sofa, eating pizza, or you know, sitting at our computer all day, typing away. So the typical role of a man has changed a lot over a hundred years. Uh, you know, uh, that is one reason for sure. Um, other big things that have happened uh, are convenience foods. So our food has completely changed. A hundred years ago, fifty years ago, you know, it was meat and three veg or whatever it was all organic it was freshly grown in the local area no gmos um now it's all convenience food with seed oils extra sugar all sorts of processed stuff inside which leads us on to the final element or one of the other elements which is the endocrine disrupting hormone uh, chemicals or the um toxins that we're sort of surrounded with and bombarded with on a daily basis and there is a huge amount of evidence that shows these chemicals are everywhere. You know, they're in our moisturizers, they're in our shampoos, they're in our food, they're in the plastic that we use, they're in the water that we drink. And all of these um, EDCs or endocrine disrupting chemicals mimic estrogen within the body. So they're affecting the hormone balance in particular within a man. Um, even going a, a layer deeper than that, the, the first um spike of testosterone in the male body actually occurs in utero so it happens and actually that causes the genital formation uh, when we are still in the womb but if our mother is being has been exposed to these chemicals or isn't eating a very good diet it affects how testosterone very first presents within the body so it's a, I might have gone slightly off on a bit of a tangent there, but it's a huge area, you know, yeah, and I, I, any I, I, reasons why. Yeah, I mean, this sounds like a fascinating, this almost sounds like a, a, a whole nother show. Uh. There's, a, there's <laughs> so much evidence out there. There's a fantastic book called Estrogen Nation, if you um, if you ever want to, to read that. It's, a, it's quite a difficult read because it's just full of all of the different articles and, and research publications that have happened over the years that demonstrate these these chemicals are dangerous right. um so yeah that's that's an, a, an interesting book you you picked up on something like, do, do, do women suffer from low testosterone they do yeah so um women men generally create about seven grams of testosterone per day in their body in their testicles um women obviously don't have testicles um but they do produce around about 0.3 of a gram within their own body and can again um, feel the effects of low testosterone so trt can be given to women as well so of course they don't need anywhere near the same amount otherwise that can um, cause masculine masculization so it might cause them to lose that femininity and become stronger changes in jaw shape things like that and you do sometimes see that in bodybuilders who have taken mm -hmm. higher than they're supposed to have but yes, women do suffer low testosterone, and yes, they do get great benefits from going on TRT. Okay, right. So you're sitting there talking to me with a hat on. Is there a link with testosterone and going bald? Um, or so, is your hair actually pink, and you don't want me to see it? Uh, no, no. So, so, I, so I've got a bit of a thing about hats. I've got many, many of them. And there's someone that asked me about it recently. I, I see it a bit like. You know those Lego men where you can take the hair off and put something else on? Yeah. yeah. Hats are a bit like that for me. So I do wear them uh, all the time. And underneath, I, I am bald. <laughs> However, that's not the testosterone. So baldness is a genetic thing. So male patent baldness, you inherit it from your mother's side. So if your mother's, if your mother's father was bald, then it's likely you will be as well. Um, taking testosterone will not increase or make you bald if you are genetically disposed to it and actually testosterone itself doesn't cause hair loss a byproduct of it dht dihydrotestosterone does now increasing your testosterone will likely cause an increase in dht which may accelerate hair loss if you have a genetic propensity to it but it will not cause it 
Okay, so this this idea of having high or low testosterone if you've got a full head of hair or you're completely bald, it's just not true. Exactly. Yeah, there okay. are many many myths and issues out there, you know, surrounding TRT, and most of them stem back to awful studies that were done, you know, fifty years ago. Um, testosterone itself, it, you know, was invented sort of over eighty years ago. Now, the gentleman that invented it um, won the Nobel Prize for their uh, work into sexual medicine. Um, it's an incredibly safe medication. As I say, it's been around for almost 100 years. It changes people's lives on a daily basis. Uh, so the, te the testosterone that people take, is, is, is that manufactured, if you like, rather than produced uh, naturally? It must, yeah. How do you get it? Yeah, it's synthetic. So it comes yeah. in many forms. Um, so it comes in gels, creams, patches, pellets, nasal sprays, uh, oral medication, uh, and, in and injectables. Um, so various forms, um, but all of it is synthetic. Okay. So how how do most men take it? You know, if if if, if you know, they've got the test, sorry, it appears you have low testosterone. What's what's next? A course of injections or pill every morning with your coffee? How does it work? Um, it's different for everybody. Uh, if you go to the NHS, you'll likely be put on a gel. Um, it's cheap, inexpensive, um, and unfortunately not very effective. Um, the reason for that is the absorption is very slow. So if you go in the, you know, if it takes hours to rub in, and you go in the gym, you sweat it off. If you put, if you go in the shower, you wash it off. If you touch someone, your wife or your children, you might contaminate them. Um, if you put a big jumper on, you're going to wipe it off. Plus, you're relying on absorption through the skin. Um, so a gel actually, the skin is pretty much designed to keep things out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It, obviously, things do absorb. Um, but you are relying on that absorption and, and many factors can affect your level. So it's hard to get a very steady state with yeah. a topical application. But if you go to the NHS, cream is the most, sorry, gel is the most likely thing you'll get. If you go to the private sector, somebody like us, we don't prescribe gels. Um, we do prescribe creams uh, and a Trevis Hydrogel, oddly is a cream or a Verabase cream. They absorb a lot faster. Um, and can have very good effects if you apply them directly to the scrotum uh, or an injection. But 90% of all the men we work would want, to, want an injection. We work with, sorry. All right. So an injection. So do they inject themselves or do they have to go to a clinic to get injected? How does that so work? We, we, we inject ourselves. Um, you know, I inject myself three times a week. Some people might do it once every two weeks. Um, most people, I would say, are, you know, two, three times a week. It's a small, you know, little insulin needle goes into the subcutaneous tissue or the fatty tissue in the belly or usually, you know, directly into your shoulder with a shallow intermuscular injection. But it's simple, painless, convenient, it takes about 20 seconds for the whole process. You don't have to worry about it rubbing in or rubbing off. Um, you know, you can just get on with your day. What's the volume of stuff that you actually inject? Uh, it depends on the dose that you're prescribed. Right. And and the frequency. So I would say it's very difficult to say. Um, it, it's small. You know, we're usually talking about, you know, say, 0. 0.2 of a mil might be, if you had to take an average, I would say somewhere around there. Okay. For people like me that don't go into labs very often, <laughs> 0. 0.2 of a mil, a thimble full? Oh, no. Like... Like maybe not even half a teaspoon. Okay. All right. All right. So tiny, really tiny. Really tiny. Yeah, you don't okay. even all, need it. Okay. All of a sudden, that doesn't seem quite so scary. Um, the yeah, the first injection, men are a little usually wary. And then after the first one, we get the same sort of feedback every time, which was, that wasn't bad. Like it was, the thought of it was worse than actually yeah. doing it. I, I, I can imagine. All right. So you, you've taken us through like the symptoms, the test, uh, how you take this stuff. What about any potential downsides? Because so so far, it all seems to be up. Yeah. <laughs> but to be honest, it downsides. is pretty much all up. Um, as I said, you know, this was invented a long time ago. It's super safe. The people that invented it won the Nobel Prize. Nobel Prizes tend not to be handed out for something that's dangerous. Um, you know, this is a super safe and effective treatment. Um, it was wrongly linked to increase in cardiac problems and increase in prostate cancer many years ago. And sadly, 
there are still some mainstream doctors if you went to along to the NHS that might still parrot that and say, oh, you shouldn't take that. It's going to cause heart attack. Um, it's actually cardioprotective. It lessens your chance of having a cardiac event when you're taking the right amount, not huge uh, levels like some people do down the chain. It, it, I always ask whether there are you know, peer reviewed uh, papers talking about this. Um, that aren't just cherry picked because you can prove yeah. almost whatever you want in some situations. Yeah, you can you can actually give I, I can give you hundreds of articles to prove what we say. But if you actually ask a GP or even an endocrinologist often to give them proof that testosterone causes a heart attack or prostate cancer, I actually can't give you one because this is just something that's been handed down over generations. This is what it causes. Ask yeah. them to provide one paper that backs that up. And you can't all the all the paper they will give you actually i mean if i if i go back i think it was the heart attack one that 50 years ago only three people were in the study none of them had their testosterone checked at the start and um, one of them actually was um castrated one person didn't finish the study and after that they said yeah testosterone caused heart attacks wow. um so actually we have far more evidence on our side than for the contrary Okay. What what about if is it like going through your teens again? Because let's face it, teens is great, but there's some rubbish that goes with it. So do you uh, have to put up with some of the rubbish you dealt with as a teen? Yeah, that's that's, a, that's actually a great question, and one we don't get very often, but it's super important because some men when they start TRT expect that within weeks or months they're going to feel like Superman. When puberty isn't uh, isn't you know a straight line and it does, certainly doesn't take weeks um it can take many many months and resetting your hormones or rebalancing them in midlife can take the same amount of time so it's a bit of a bumpy ride um most men will sail through it quite quickly quite easily uh, very quickly sort of you know get back to their optimal levels but not everyone sometimes yeah it can be a bumpy ride it can take many many months what I'm kind of thinking of is, you know, a, a teenage boy between, I don't know, 14 to 18 or a bit older, I think they're indestructible, um, you, you know, uh, do crazy things. I, I'm just trying to think of some examples, you know, climb ridiculous trees, climb ridiculous cliff faces and just generally have fun. And it's part of finding out about life and boundaries. Now, if we have suddenly a load of middle aged men doing this. It's, it's kind of this is uh, a recipe for disaster isn't it yeah i think i think it's probably more going on in an adolescent's body than just their changes in hormones that drive that sort of behavior they're they're finding out who they are in the world they're finding out what it is to be a man what it is to be stronger than perhaps their female counterparts um so there's a lot more i think that goes into it sort of in, in, psychologically the common feedback that we get from gentlemen that we work with when they go through this process isn't that they start climbing trees again or anything like that it is that they became the best version of themselves again so they have this newfound drive and that drive bleeds over into every area of their life so they want to be the best father the best husband the best friend the best business person uh, one person very recently said ross i've just turned 40 i said i know he said i want to line up all the 18 year olds in the gym challenge them to a race because I, I think i could actually win uh, i've just got this <laughs> newfound drive again and you know for 10 years i'd lost that i'd put weight on my confidence had gone down i didn't feel like me and now i'm back so this is the sort of feedback we get on a, on a weekly basis okay all right that's good uh one i, I want to ask about one specific detail what about zits the zits make a reoccurrence um, so that's a really interesting question again. Um, testosterone replacement therapy does not cause spots. Testoster increasing your testosterone levels increases oil production within the skin. Now, most men with low testosterone will actually have quite dry skin. So when you put a small amount of testosterone in to bring them back to an optimal level, their skin usually improves and people go, wow, skin has not looked this good in years. Okay. Now, um, where it can cause spots is if it goes too high. So again, the guys down the gym are taking way too much, remember, 
that then can cause increases in oil production and it can cause then spots and typically it'll be across the back of the neck across the back of the shoulders I mean, in the two years we've been working with gentlemen, we've had two men who've reported problems um, with spots. So if you've already got healthy or oily skin and then you increase that production, it could lead to spots. Yeah. But if you're only putting therapeutic doses in, the chances of that are very low. Yeah. All right. No, I get it. Um, what about uh, long term use? Because pe people have, well, it's probably fair to say I've just started doing this kind of hormone replacement a bit more often are we sort of running a bit of a long-term experiment on what's going to happen to these guys in you know 20 30 years time uh again and now you know and just to disagree with you again this has been around for 80 years it's super right. safe there are so many long-term studies about this you know it 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 doesn't cause any long-term problems in fact it's the opposite so and actually you've been taking it for a while yourself haven't you <laughs> I've been taking it for, for a decade. Our chief medical yeah. advisor has been taking it for 40 years. You know, there are men that have been taking it for longer than that. We know it protects the heart. We know it protects you against cognitive decline. So arguably might prevent Alzheimer's. It increases bone density. So it lessens the chance of a break in later life. And we know that breaking a bone, particularly the hip in later life, often causes to a decline in mobility and unfortunately death. We know that it increases musculature and actually the muscle is the largest organ in the body and there is a very strong correlation with the size of that organ and your health span so living a longer healthier life and a doctor put it to me very bluntly recently he was an er doctor in america and he said he sees so many people come in say pneumonia or a fall if they have three or four kilos of muscle to lose because they've got good muscle in the first place, they usually walk out. If they don't have that muscle to lose and they're bed bound for weeks or months, they usually go to a home or often don't come out at all. Right. So from a longevity perspective, it has so many benefits to have optimal hormones. Good. So if people are listening to this and thinking, you know, this sounds interesting or they, they'd like to find out a bit more for whatever reason, for themselves or friends or, or what have you, uh, what are some good resources uh, is is the the NHS website is often very good for lots of things. Is it good for this particular topic? Um, in a word, no. Uh, it's um unfortunately not up to date with the most recent research. Um, it still is a little vague on whether there even believes in the andropause. I um, mean, the, the male version of of the menopause. So I would say the NHS um website isn't the best place if you want the most up to date research. But thankfully, there are lots of other options out there. So, you know, a, a Google search will you'll come across many companies, including our own, of course, Alphagenics, where all the research is backed up by articles. And you can usually find those um, on, on the website as well. So do your homework. Don't necessarily listen to the, the NHS, who are yet yeah, a little bit like, well, andropause might exist, might not, might just be depression. OK, all right. Um just just let me ask you another question about the depression thing it was probably an impossible question because it's how, how common is it to mix this low testosterone problem with with depression well the, the longer someone has low testosterone for the longer it goes undiagnosed the more likely you are to suffer with some sort of mental health problem as well right. um imagine your you, you your mood is low it's been low for a long time emotionally you don't feel like yourself perhaps you're you know crying one moment and then irritated the next you put weight on you look in the mirror you don't even recognize yourself anymore your confidence goes down you lose confidence in yourself as a man that for any length of time of course is going to affect mental health as well so yes there is some uh overlap but thankfully uh, when people start TRT, a lot of those symptoms change and mental health will often improve uh, as well. Uh, is it a panacea? Does it fix everything? No, of course it's not. It's just a tool in our toolbox. And we very much uh, you know, educate all of the gentlemen that we work with that TRT is incredible. Like It transforms people's lives, but it is not magic. It will not outstrip or destructive life choices you can't sit on the sofa eat pizza don't exercise 
go to bed late, get up early, drink loads of alcohol and think that TRT is going to make a difference. Um, you have to be combining it with optimal lifestyle choices as well. So our service is very much holistic. We talk to them about, you know, everything from spiritual health. So, you know, meditation and practices like this, um, all the way through to the types of exercise that are better for testosterone production than others. Um, sometimes we meet with a little bit of resistance, like why would meditation change my physical health um, or uh, testosterone levels? But actually, a study came out very recently that showed that increase in spiritual health increases psychological health and psychological health increased physical health. So actually believing in a higher power, regardless of whether that's God, the universe, um, the one or whatever, some sort of higher power increases physical health interesting Mate. stuff right so i snuck one last question in there so thank you very much one final thing i don't think you've you've, you've done it yet what's uh, what's the website of your company thank you very much yeah for, for asking i always like to give a very balanced opinion so it's not you know not here to try and sell something just to try and educate people and if they do choose to buy from someone of course we'd be happy to talk, talk to them um but it's alpha genics so that's with an x rather than a c alpha genics g-e-n-i-x dot co dot uk okay excellent all right well, ross thank you very much indeed for chatting no problem mike i really enjoyed it have a great day Thank you to my guest, Ross Tompkins of Alpha Genics. A big thank you to you for listening and have a healthy week until next week. Thanks for listening to the Relax Back UK show. Join me, Mike Dilk, again next week for more fascinating interviews and chat. If you're listening to the podcast version, please subscribe, like, and share it with your family and friends. And have a healthy week until next week.